I'm an undergrad at Berkeley, but I'm going to talk to you about some work with Oleg Nedin and Hui, who conveniently just spoke before me, um, and did a lot of the hard work in terms of introducing why we should care about globular clusters. And this isn't working, right? I'll just rely on this. So uh, in the last 20 or so years, uh, we've studied globular clusters in the local universe in a lot of detail. And we're now getting to the point where we can study not only individual clusters, but ensembles of clusters, globular cluster systems. So there's this famous now, there's this now famous relation between the combined mass in globular clusters and the host halo mass. It spans about four decks in halo mass. Um, but there are also other interesting trends. Um, so uh, here are two, which are, I think are uh, not advertised as often, but I think are also interesting. Uh, up here uh, on your right is the, uh, oh sorry, on your left, is the mean metallicity of all of the clusters within a given galaxy, uh, plotted as a function of the host halo mass. Uh, and on the, on the right is the dispersion in metallicities, so just plot a histogram of all of the cluster metallicities, take the width of that histogram, um, and both scale uh, weakly with the host halo mass, or stellar mass. There's also this famous um, bimodality, multimodality in the globular cluster metallicity distribution, uh, which was first recognized in, in really great detail in the Virgo cluster survey. Um, but in the last five or so years, as we've gotten metallicity distributions of globular clusters in brightest cluster galaxies, um, thanks to Bill Harris's HST survey, uh, what we're finding is that the metallicity distribution actually gets fatter. So you get a broad, uh, almost unimodal distribution at an FE over H of about minus one. And there are tons of other interesting um, scaling relations for globular clusters um, that we've now uh, really started to drill down on uh, now that we have good statistics. So unfortunately, as Squay discussed, this is a super hard problem to tackle in cosmological simulations. Uh, you just don't have the resolution uh, needed um, to do this in, a, in, a, in the proper statistical way which is required. Um, so we have to do something which is computationally cheaper. So I'm going to do something uh, very computationally cheap. I'm going to take dark matter merger trees, uh, just simple dark matter merger trees. We use ones from uh, Illustrious's dark matter only run. Doesn't really matter what you use and then make a simple onsots, which is motivated both in quay simulations, as he showed, um, and also in observations of young massive clusters in the nearby universe. I'm just going to assume that massive bound clusters form when a dark matter halo is accreting very rapidly. Um, these are often major mergers, but it doesn't have to be. And then uh, we just assume that the total mass that forms in globulars at one of these epochs just scales linearly with the cold gas mass in the galaxy. The cold gas mass from there just comes from empirical scaling relations. Um, so we mostly use uh, data from uh, Reinhardt's group and parameterize the cold gas mass just as a function of stellar mass and redshift. Uh, from there, the stellar mass just comes from uh, Peter's stellar mass halo mass relation, 2013, not 2018. Haven't had time to update it. Um, and then, once we have a total mass to form in globulars, we just draw clusters from a cluster IMF, just m to the minus 2. Again, this is well motivated both in Hoya simulations and um, in the local universe, in the uh, local young massive clusters. The metallicity of each cluster just comes from a, a galaxy stellar mass metallicity relation. So it's set by the metallicity of the host galaxy with some additional scatter um, and also redshift evolution. And again, this relation is an empirical relation. So uh, almost the entire model relies on uh, empirical observed scaling relations. Then given a population of clusters, we just uh, evolve them uh, using prescriptions for both stellar evolution and dynamical evolution for the local tidal field and two-body relaxation. In an average sense, we don't have any spatial information uh, in this model. Evolve them up to redshift zero. Constrain are just two free parameters against uh, metallicity and mass distributions, and we're done. So, looking at uh, some of the results now, 
so the shaded contour here shows the uh, result from the model. You can see it runs through the data points very well, uh, but what I want to highlight in particular is that the model trend is clearly nonlinear, uh, but we think it's actually highlighting nonlinearity that's already there in the data. So if you just calculate the RMS around the median trend in, in our model relation, um, it does significantly better than what you get from just the best linear fit. Uh, the scatter in the model relation is just 0.2 dex. So the observed scatter is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4 dex. Uh, and Bill Harris uh, actually argues that once you take into account the observational errors, uh, this is actually closer to about 0.2 dex intrinsic scatter. Looking again at these other scaling relations, uh, here's the mean metallicity. See the model trend runs through uh, these data points very well, including capturing this flattening of the uh, mean metallicity in the most massive galaxies. More interestingly, uh, for the dispersion in metallicities, we're consistently underpredicting the normalization. So we're getting the scaling right here, uh, but for reasonable uh, scatters in our galactic scaling relations, for the gas fractions and the metallicities at high redshift, uh, we just can't get the right normalization. So we think this may be pointing to something interesting, but we're not sure what it is. So if you have ideas, please talk to me. And it's uh, both of these results are very robust to changes in these uh, galactic scaling relations as well. So I hope I've convinced you that this is a, a reasonable and interesting model. Um, so now let's look at where and when globulars are forming. The upper panel here is the cosmic time at which they're forming. And the lower panel is the halo mass uh, in which they're forming. And I've split into the metal rich and the metal poor clusters. Uh, those are the red and blue colors. The first thing to point out is that in massive galaxies, uh, globular cluster formation is pushed to higher and higher redshift. This is similar to what we see in, um, it, for the overall buildup of the field stars. So we know more massive galaxies have older stellar populations. The metal poor clusters, as you expect, are forming around redshifts of three to five, um, so at higher redshift in a fairly constant range of halo mass, actually, about few times 10 to the 10 solar masses. Whereas the metal-rich clusters are forming around redshift of two, near the peak of cosmic star formation, um, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, but they're also forming over a much wider range of halo mass. So they're spanning about two decks in halo mass, from 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 13. So motivated by this, and I'm sorry, this doesn't show up very well. Um, but motivated by this, we went to just check uh, what fraction of the clusters are forming Ex situ, so they're forming in satellites and merging in later. And that's what's plotted on the y-axis here. And I've split again into metal poor and metal rich. And so what you see is that at low halo masses, most of the clusters form in situ. But as you move to higher and higher halo masses, uh, uh, especially about around 10 to the 13 and a half and later, almost all of the clusters are forming uh, ex situ. And even though the metal rich clusters are forming preferentially in situ compared to the metal poor ones, once you've gotten to these very high uh, galaxy or halo masses, almost everything uh, is coming from satellites. And again, um, similar to what we see for the field stars, at least in illustrious. And then the final thing I want to point out, as we've discussed, um, you can't observationally tell whether something is formed ex situ or in situ. So here's what happens when you take out the ex situ clusters um, and only consider the ones that formed uh, in situ. At low halo masses, you get, almost you get an almost identical result. Once you push to higher and higher uh, masses, the contribution from ex situ clusters uh, is, it, it increases. And most of the clusters that form ex situ are going to be uh, more metal poor. And so what happens is you inflate the mean metallicity um, actually by a lot. So in the most massive galaxies, uh, you get an offset of about half a dex or so. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there, leave some summary points and take any questions. Thanks. Uh, okay. Hello. Uh, it's very nice work. So uh, I wonder. Um, you mentioned the scatter uh, of the uh, globular abundance halo mass relation, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, what's the main source of that scatter. Is it from the merger trees or is it from the gas content uncertainties? 
if it's from the merger trees, then can you just use the scatter in the observed relation to put constraint on the formation history of the host system? That would be cool, right? Yeah, I agree. Um, so we haven't done a detailed analysis of um, what, where the scatter is coming from, but uh, thankfully it's a simple model, so it's coming from one of three places. Um, the gas fractions and the metal, actually even the metallicities don't matter. So it's either the gas fractions at high redshift, so we use a factor of two scatter there, um, or it's coming from the assembly history. Um, so it's very simple to check, and uh, what we're working on now is really drilling down on, on the origins of all these relations. So it was mentioned during the discussion in the last uh, talk that tidal shocks and disruption are really important for taking the initial cluster mass function and giving us what we see at redshift zero. Mm -hmm. And obviously that doesn't have, that's not a linear function of the cluster mass. Uh, do you have any plans to include a, a, a parameterization for this effect? Um, not right now. So one of the, the great advantages of the model, of course, is it has uh, two free parameters. It's extremely simple. Um, so right now what we do for, for tidal disruption um, is take it into account in sort of an average sense. It reproduces um, just like Quay showed, um, starting from a power law IMF. Uh, you get a log normal distribution at redshift zero. Um, but we have not thought um, carefully about putting this in, in, in a more detailed sense yet. Hi. I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, for a typical like Milky Way size halo, what is the fraction of uh, in situ versus ex situ uh, um, the globular clusters in your in your model? I, I want to say it's close to, to fifty percent, but I've lost my plot. Um, <laughs> um, no, no, no worries. Um, so it's closer to about thirty percent. Is that true for both the blue and the red, or like both the metal rich and the metal? The metal pores are about forty, and the metal rich is about fifteen. Um, and the Milky Way is about 70% metal poor, so actually you can calculate it more carefully. Yeah. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.